service this morning. Today is the uh, seventh Sunday after Pentecost, and today uh, we, we focus on the fact that Jesus preserves our faith even in times of persecution. When we face persecution in our in our uh, personal lives as well as our our lives as as uh, uh, members of a congregation or even as a whole of the Christian faith, sometimes we have to face. National, uh, natural calamities, political upheaval, even death. But Jesus owns those he loves. We are his. And in the circumstances such as, as these problems that we have in our life, Jesus is there with his word to guide us and to protect us. Therefore, the Christian perseveres in their faith when when that, that individual is in God's Word, uh, and in, in Jesus and by Jesus. We follow the order of service found in your service folder. We begin with our opening prayer this morning. Uh, God bless your worship this morning. O Lord, our Maker, Redeemer, and Comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. We pray you to open our hearts by your Holy Spirit. That through the preaching of your word we may be taught to repent of our sins, to believe on Jesus in life and death, and to grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us for Christ's sake. Amen. We sing our first hymn, hymn 412.
hearts unto God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us. And for his sake forgives us all our sins. To all who believes on his name, he gives power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Grant this Lord unto us all. Amen. Glory be to God in the highest.
to the church in Corinth, beginning with the seventh verse. Therefore, to keep you from becoming arrogant due to the extraordinary nature of these revelations, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, so that I would not become arrogant. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, and he, that he would take it away from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, because my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will be glad to boast all the more in my weakness, my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may shelter me. That is why I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecution, in difficulties, for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Here ends our second lesson. Please rise in honor of Jesus' name as we read the gospel lesson for today, the sixth chapter of Mark, beginning with the first verse, and this will also serve as our sermon text this morning. Jesus left there and went to his hometown. His disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did this man learn these things? What is this wisdom that had been given to this man? How is it that miracles such as these are performed by his hand? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own house. He could not do any miracles there except to lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went around the villages teaching. Here ends the Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God be
from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our text this morning is our Gospel lesson, the sixth chapter of Mark's Gospel, verses 1 through 6, which we read just moments ago. Your friends, tell the dean, in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what word stuck out for you today as we read our Gospel lesson? For me, it was the word amazed. It's kind of the key word for this section of Scripture. So that sent me chasing down the rabbit hole to find pe uh, to, uh, what, what people find amazing. I came across the YouTube channel that was entitled That's Amazing. So I, I checked it out. It's, it's two kids from Wisconsin that can do all these kinds of trick shots, whether it's with a paper airplane or a frisbee or a dart or flicking a bottle cap or even the bottle itself uh, to get it stand just right. And you can waste hours of time watching things like this. It's rather entertaining. And when you watch it, you can't help but say things like, wow, that's amazing. So why are these, why, are the, why were the people amazed in Jesus' time, in our lesson? Well, at first reading, it sounds rather positive. They say, he began, the text says, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. However, what follows is what makes it a little concerning. First of all, Mark chapter 1 says that people were amazed because he taught them like one who had authority. It's a good thing. Mark chapter 7 talks about how the people are, were amazed because Jesus does everything well, even making the deaf hear. But here in chapter 6, here in Nazareth, Jesus' hometown, why were they amazed? What hits them as amazing? Where did this man learn these things? What is this wisdom they have been given to this man? How is this that how is that miracle how is it that miracles such as these are performed by his hands? And now here's the real clue as to what's going on in their hearts. They say, Isn't this a carpenter? Isn't this the carpenter? In other words, who does this guy think he is to preach to us like this? We watched him grow up. We, he's, he's got brothers here. He's got sisters here. Who knows? Uh, who, who doesn't know his mom Mary? There's nothing special about this guy. And in some ways, I think maybe they have a little bit of a point. There weren't a whole lot of secrets in the little town of Nazareth. The whole town sat on about 30 acres of land. Now, if my calculations are correct, that's a circle with a diameter from here to Holton Public School High School. And the population probably was between 200 and 400 people in the time of Jesus. That's a very small town. You think about that. If you, if that was your whole town and you didn't drive off to work every day and then come home and close your garage door and sit in your air-conditioned house, how long would it take for you to get to know everyone? Not very long. And if any one of them got up right here, right now, and started to teach new things, what would your reaction be? Well, where'd this guy come from? Have you ever heard the phrase, familiarity breeds contempt? Now, I'm not entirely sure that I buy into that, at least completely. There's something to be said about a familiar sweatshirt or a well-used recliner that's comfortable and, and has your own imprint in it. That's comfortable, not contemptible. But I do see that, that familiarity can breed. Think of sports rivalries, alliance 
don't necessarily like the Bears, and vice versa. Or Cubs don't like the Cardinals, because they're in the same division, they play each other all the time. Familiarity breeds contempt. Or have you ever heard someone described at work as being, uh, doing their work as doing the same old, same old? That's usually not a good thing. You're bored. You're unfulfilled. When it comes to Jesus, are you familiar to the point where it's comfortable or contemptible? What is your familiarity level with Jesus? Now, none of us are familiar with him like his fellow Nazarenes were. You read sections like this, and maybe even it even piques your interest a little bit. Jesus had brothers and sisters? What were they like? Wonder what it would have been like to be there as he was raising from a little boy to an adult. Or you think about growing up with someone, you think about what they were like in school. The Bible says that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature. So maybe these people are thinking back to Jesus in school. Setting aside his omniscience, maybe Jesus struggled with math or reading. Maybe he had to work really hard. Or what was it like to buy cabinets that were handcrafted by Jesus? Did he have a good reputation? Did he make solid stuff? Or maybe he was just doing a job because that's what his father taught him and maybe he didn't have those skills. Maybe it would be like buying a, a out of the box car, uh, a cupboard. Maybe seem like a cheaply made thing. Like I said, whenever we hear something about Jesus' personal life, there's this curiosity because we don't get to hear about it very often. I think that's my point. We're curious about the stuff that we don't know because maybe we feel a little bored by all the familiar stuff. Yes, yes, I, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, he was crucified, he died, he was buried. All that stuff's familiar. We maybe didn't grow up in the same town as Jesus, but a majority of us grew up with Jesus. Home devotions, Lutheran schools, Sunday school, weekly worship. Maybe you even felt it was shoved down your throat. You are content maybe to stop learning about him because, well, we have content for him. But even if this is your first time in worship or your first time maybe in a long time, just by the nature of where you live, you are familiar with Jesus. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't have to tell you that Jesus was a religious person who lived about 2,000 years ago. I don't have to tell you that Jesus died on a cross. You maybe even know that Jesus and Christ are the same person. Maybe you know him as a miracle worker or as a life coach. And even if you don't know the ins and the outs of Jesus and his teachings, you're familiar, at least, with the concept. This familiarity, whether it's little or a lot, can be dangerous. Like his fellow citizens, familiarity can breed contempt where we devalue who Jesus is. And if we devalue who he is, then we certainly will devalue what he says or at least the parts that I don't agree with, or that I don't like to hear. And often, I think that's the crux of the problem. The problem is me. 
When I look at me, and we live in a country that's all about me, right? We celebrate our independence. When I look at me, Jesus becomes less. Not because I'm greater than Jesus, certainly, but because when I look at me, I really don't have time for anything else. Everything else just gets in the way or is a nuisance, including Jesus. He becomes boring because it's not about me. He becomes something old from the past because it's not about me in the present. And the irony of it all is that if we look at Jesus, if we look to Jesus, we will see, actually see ourselves as more valuable, except we never get to that point. We're always focusing on ourselves. I think I had a, I think of a conversation that I had with a, a pastor friend of mine. We were talking about uh, old times when we first got into our seminary days where it takes like four months to make your first sermon. And uh, my friend had uh, all arranged that he was going to preach his first sermon in his hometown where he grew up, in the church that he grew up in. Which was great, except for our professor uh, who, who was giving him his first sermon, uh, that we call it the fancy term is homiletics professor. He assigned him with this text, this particular text from John or Mark chapter 6, 1 through 6. And um, he was supposed to write that for his first sermon. Now, how is he going to go to his home congregation and preach a sermon on a prophet who is not welcome in his hometown? Oh, my friend got a little nervous about that, so I went to go talk to the professor. He said, I, you know, I'm preaching my first sermon in my home congregation, so do you think you could decide a different text for me? What did the pastor say? What did the student the professor say? He said, hmm, I thought this was about Jesus and not about you. It's not only what my friend needed to hear. It's what we all need to hear, isn't it? I often wonder what amazes me about church. Two years ago, in this, uh, in this sanctuary, we, had, we hosted Bethany Lutheran College Choirs. And uh, afterwards, I heard numerous uh, comments from various members saying that they were amazing, and they were. They were very good. Maybe you pick up our Mission News publication and see all the amazing things that our Senate is doing in other countries. And every once in a while, I get compliments on a, maybe a sermon that had touched on an individual or a congregation that I knew nothing about their circumstances, and yet it seemed to be tailored fit to them. Of course, that makes me feel good. And I'm not trying to downplay all of these blessings that God gives. But is our spiritual life all about amazing music, amazing opportunities for mission work, amazing sermons, etc.? You fill it in. Don't let these amazing blessings ever cloud just how amazing, in a good way, Jesus is. Don't let these treasures that God gives us devalue Jesus as the priceless treasure that he is, or at least should be, in our eyes. You know, it wasn't only a crowd that was amazed that day. This carpenter think he is. Jesus walked away from that crowd, and he was amazed as well. Amazed by their lack of faith. What's the key to not having Jesus walk away from us because we see him only as a carpenter? It's knowing this. It's knowing that Jesus, whom we have become so or maybe even too familiar with, is completely 
familiar with us. I mean that. He is completely familiar with us. He knows all of our thoughts. He knows how we mentally yawned at the thought of reading the Bible or going to church. He knows all of our lusts and how we think we would be so much more exciting to satisfy those desires instead of paying attention to boring old Jesus and what he has to say about them. He knows all our doubts about his love and his care for our lives. Even though he has proved it by his own life. He was completely familiar with us, warts and all. And do you know what he says? He says, I love them. I love them every day the same. I send, I'll send them mercies that are new to them every morning. I'll care for them. I'll die for them. I'll build a home in heaven for, for them so that they can live forever with me. Because I want to be with them. I never get tired of them. I guess you could say he's quite a carpenter. And that's only scratching the surface of what makes Jesus so amazing. You know, at the beginning of the sermon, I was kind of chasing a rabbit for illustrations about what's amazing. And yeah, I came across that's amazing YouTube channel, which with its 3.6 million subscribers. But I also came across another YouTube video. One that had only 2,400 views since it was posted seven years ago. But this is what the author had to write. She wrote a, she wrote a poem and entitled Jesus is Amazing. And I'd like to share that with you here as we close today. Jesus is amazing. That's all I know. Not just because he walked on water or turned water into wine. Not just because he died and rose again. Not just because he was the Son of God. Not just because he's strong and almighty or because he's heaven sent. Not just because he, he's just like you and me, even though he never sinned. But because he loves me des despite my flaws. And, but because he forgives me of my sins. Because he puts himself in my presence even though I'm not perfect like he is. He sees, he's, he's seen my mind and doesn't hate me when he should. He's seen my terrible past and still wants to use me to do good. He's healed my broken heart after I broke his. Jesus is amazing because he sacrificed everything just so I could live. He was there for me when everyone was too embarrassed to be. When I got, when I got too weak, he was the one who carried me. When I thought I'd ruined my life, he gave me another chance. He revealed my beauty to me because I couldn't see it at first glance. He took my sickness away, the one in my mind, body, and spirit. He was the only one who listened to me when no one else wanted to hear it. When no one knew my pain, he was the one wiping my tears. When I was convinced I failed, he took away all my fears. When I got myself in a trap, he created a way out for me. When everyone told me to quit, he was the one who encouraged me. Jesus is amazing because he could have let me go a very long time ago. I messed up so, so much, but he kept on holding me close. He loved a sinner like me, a fornicator, a lying thief. He was the only one who opened his arms to an underdog like me. Jesus is amazing not just because someone told me so and I decided to believe, but because he saved me from self-destruction. He is the reason I am set free. Jesus is amazing.
is right. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. His peace be with you. Amen. We continue now with the prayer of church. Father, for giving us life and breath, talent and energy, we thank you. For income and nourishment, for honest work and opportunities to be useful, we look gratefully to you as our provider. For safety in our travels, we rejoice in the protection of your angels' gift. For national peace, public prosperity, and moral consciousness in all citizens, hear our prayers. Lord Jesus, though you were, uh, th through you we have full rights as the children of God. We love the Father. What love the Father has lavished on us through our relationship with you. We praise you for saving us and giving your life as a ransom for our sin. May our spirits revive in the rest and peace of your forgiveness. Holy Spirit, through word and sacrament, restore to us the joy of your salvation. Cause the good seed of the word to produce sturdy faith and godly attitudes and behavior in each believer. We rejoice this day in the fellowship we enjoy in our congregation and our synod. Keep our parish and synodical leaders faithful to their tasks. Make them men of both courage and prayer. Preserve Christ-centered doctrine and practice in our fellowship at all times. Make each of us active in Christian service and supportive of our leaders. Open our eyes to see the spirit, the spiritual dangers facing those who have not yet trusted you as Savior and Lord. Move us to share with them the hope of unending life that we have in you. Go with us into our world and support us in all we do to your glory. Amen. We pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. At this time, we bring our offering. We give thee but thy own, whatever the gifts may be. All that we have is thine alone. A trust, O Lord, from thee. Seated, we sing our next hymn, hymn 232. <laughs>
We thank you, Almighty God, that you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the head cornerstone. Grant that we may be joined together in unity of spirit by the doc their doctrine, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable unto you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Sign up. Um, okay, oh, those are all of my 
announcements. Are there any? Oh, yes. Oh, thank you. I forgot to put that in there. Yes, highway pickup is 17 through the 20. I'm sorry, what was it? Okay. And um, so if there are some sign up sheets out there uh, for the different sections that we have highway pickup. Uh, if you would like to sign up for those sections, uh, please, uh, please do so. Thank you. I'm sorry I forgot to put that in the boat. Anything else? Um, oh, we do have the, um, the uh, second quarter um, voters meeting. That's what I'm looking for. Voters meeting coming up at the end of the month. Um, we will have information out for you uh, sometime this week um, as far as looking at what we're going to be talking about. Um, we'll be putting those out in the Netflix as well. Until we meet again, God's blessings be with all of you.